Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. In 10 days. (laughs) (laughs) The countdown begins. 10 days till the Tame Your Inner Critic workshop with Sarah and Stephanie in New York. We still have about five tickets available for our workshop in New York on the 6th of May, which is just 10 days away. So if you've been thinking about coming and joining us, or if you happen to be free on that day, it's an afternoon workshop. So even if you needed to travel into the city and travel home, you could probably get away without an overnight stay. We're going to go for Mm. drinks and something to eat afterwards. It is going to be a small, intimate gathering, and we would love to connect with you if you're around and want to come and connect with us. Beautiful. Thank you, Steph. You're beautiful too. But um, <laughs> in the <laughs> if you wanna if you wanna find out more or book your space, just have a look in the show notes. We will pop a link down there. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Hello, Steph. Hi. May I say that you sure sound good today? <laughs> what do you think? I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm using my new mic, and so are you, for that matter. Oh no, we've recorded one with yours. I know. I know. Tell but us, yeah. listeners, do we sound crisp and professional? We have new microphones and they are sure microphones, which hence the, hence the we start again. <laughs> metaf- no, absolutely not. <laughs> We're rolling. I also want to offer that we are recording at such a wildly, at least for me, this is like the opposite of the day. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if our energies feel different. Although usually for you, it's not that far off. But... We're recording at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And normally, well, this would be midnight in the UK. So we've never done a time like this before. No. But usually you've got me in the morning right after my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a it's been a day. My kids are home from they have their spring break. So mm. they're here all day. My in laws were here earlier. Mike had an emergency at work, but it's nice that it's evening. I'm ca- I'm I'm getting tired. Can you tell? I couldn't actually until you started talking about it. And then when you named it, then I could it's uh, like you let your tiredness come out. Uh, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good, actually. Yeah. I think in the afternoon I have a slump, which is when we normally record. And actually oh. I probably get like a second wind in the evening. So this probably works quite well. I mean, I don't know how much mm. longer we want to talk about doing a podcast. We could do the <laughs> podcast. or Versus actually doing the podcast. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> okay. Uh, it's like when you've got to hit a word count. And you just yeah. do like yeah, a yeah. filler. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about today? Today, we were going to talk about rejection. We were going to talk about that last week, but I was having a moment. I steamrolled that. (laughs) And I'm feeling much better, if anyone was concerned. I was. Oh, bless you. Nice to know. She cares. She cares. Yeah. I told that. I was going to go off on another tangent, but maybe we'll podcast. Um, Rejection. What are we talking about when we're talking about rejection? Are we talking about other people being rejected by others? That's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Okay. What are you talking about? Well, I I certainly thought that would be a big part of it, but I was also thinking about rejecting our bodies. Oh. And um, rejecting ourselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's all, it's always going to come back down to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could start with others. Others came to my mind first because it is a ooh, it's such a um, it's such a it's such a delicate, sensitive, piercing topic to me, like the thought of rejection, talking about stories of rejection. It's one of the, it's one of the things I will really, really try at length to avoid that feeling. I hate it. (laughs) I mean, who likes it? But I feel like there are people who, in my mind, handle it better than me. You know, that there's people who don't let it in. Or let it mean something to the degree that I feel like I I, I let it mean. And I'm speaking a bit like, I, I think that social media has actually thickened my skin a little bit around this uh, and helped me sort of be exposed to more rejection and, and make some peace with some of that. But typically, I think that I, I think that most of my eating disorder was spent trying to avoid that, that exact experience. Have you heard of rejection sensitive dysphoria? No, but something tells me I'm about to. You're about to get schooled 
it's an extreme reaction to rejection and it often shows up in people who have ADHD and other sort of non-neurotypical um what's the right word what do we say instead what's the word atypical atypical no neurodivergent (laughs) yeah so in other people in other neurodivergent people there you go got yeah. to it so maybe got the evening's anyway. not so good for us <laughs> maybe not like i knew that i know how to talk about this stuff <laughs> honest <laughs> like what's the word and so the brain actually experiences rejection with extreme intensity so they've looked anyway on fmri scans and the brain reacts in the same way as it does with physical pain the response is like physical pain when you're experiencing rejection And if you think about this, when this is happening in a brain scan, it's not going to be the big rejection. You know, they're not going to get somebody's partner come in and break up with them while they're in an MRI scanner. (laughs) So this is going to be smaller experiences of rejection that still show this pain response and that the brain doesn't seem to read it differently from physical pain. But of course, even the memory, well, of course, the memory Mm. of physical pain, the brain just kind of goes, yeah, that hurt. But the memory of emotional pain, we can reignite that and relive that over yes. and over again so mm-hmm. this is not that people can't handle it in a certain way and I'm not suggesting that you fall into this category but it can be to do with just how our brain processes this experience that doesn't mean you don't handle it as quote-unquote well as somebody else might I take it very personally and I'll make a story about it but I feel I mean when you say that it feels it, it might be experienced the same way as pain I mean, we've talked a little bit about, like, I don't think I have a funny relationship with pain, but I, but I feel it viscerally. Like when I have experienced a, a perceived rejection, I flood. Like I have that <clears throat> stomach drop and, uh, and like head to toe, something comes over me. It's circulating in my whole body. And I notice it with little things. Like when I was starting on Instagram, and I'm, I'm speaking about this because on social media, it becomes so apparent. You know how in the beginning, before you have a thousand followers, it goes one by one. <laughs> it tells you when you move from 801 followers to 802. And so every time I would, <laughs> I would look and it would be 834, 833, you know, like I would say, who, who left? Who left and why? What did I do? What did I say? They hate me. Who else is going to hate me? You know, it's just this whole thing. Is, <laughs> it's just like a mind move. It happens too when people unsubscribe from, from my newsletter. I'm like, what did I say? Like, what did I do? What did I? Oh, you didn't like my story. Oh, gee, you're right. I'm so narcissistic. You know, like I'm just <laughs> focused on me all the time. And I'll come up with this whole thing, no matter even if 50 people have written in and been like, I loved that, you know. But the one who unsubscribed is like, oh, they see something that no one else can see. They see the truth. And it's this practice, really, at this point of of reestablishing a center. Because it's very easy to just fall into a, into a, into a hole of, I suck, or what am I doing wrong? Or I don't know. What is the story? I suppose there might be different ones for different people. What's, I mean, do you experience rejection in any similar way or are you one no, of No, I'm totally people? cool with it. Totally yeah. cool with it. <laughs> um, I think my tendency is if I sense rejection coming is to reject first. Yes which is the withdrawal just to get out of the way. That was always my pattern. And I've done a lot of work in therapy on that about being able to stay and to be more vulnerable. Something that Byron Katie says, she's got this book called A Mind at Home with Itself. And I swear every time I listen to this book and I've listened to it about seven or eight times, I feel like it's the first time I'm hearing it. It's a really bizarre experience that I have with this book. So recently this one really struck me again, even though I've probably heard it a few times. She says that When people reject you, it's only because you don't fit in with the way they want the world to be. Right. And when she said that, it was at a time where I was feeling a bit hurt and rejected by a particular friend. And it gave, it was, you know, sometimes when you just hear the thing you need to hear at the time you need to hear it. And I was like, oh, okay. Because it wasn't really personal. This friend was going off and doing something else. It wasn't aimed at me. And I rationally knew that, but it still felt like this loss and it was something that I felt hurt and angry about and then when I heard that I was like it worked in that moment and that's not to say that I wouldn't forget that in a moment but if I can grasp that and come back to that in a moment where I might feel rejected or even like you say with unsubscribed and that kind of thing when people come at you on social media about this that and the other you can 
to come back to that, okay, I don't fit in with the way they want the world to be. Yeah. Is is that it? Is that all you need to do? And then you can you can make peace? Well, that's I'm trying to think of recent examples. That's a recent example and it gave me a lot of peace. Mm. That and I actually spoke to my friend about it too, <laughs> which also <laughs> helped. <laughs> and she owned her stuff, which also helped. Uh, yeah, that does help. That does help. So there was there was layers to it as well. But in the moment, it, it brought me relief in the moment. Yeah. That's some cognitive work and I'm here for it. I can feel when I need to remember something like that, when I need to. It's a bit of intellectualizing. And and I think intellectualizing sometimes gets a bad rap. In fact, I sometimes give it a bad rap because, you know, I think there's this emotional component to things that we're sometimes not addressing. But I think this is where intellectualizing is so helpful because if I can get out of my flood and be like, wait a minute, I can usually definitely see, you know, and 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 apply something like that. It's the non-attachment all of a sudden, right? Like it 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 totally folds into that concept for me. The second that I can I can think of it that way, I really see it as true. And I think for all of us, our egos and our identities are are very much, um, you know, that's what's guiding what we're drawn to and what we're not drawn to. So I can make sense of that. But it's one of the few scenarios that I feel like it's much more helpful for me to stay in my head than to go into my body because my body's having a different kind of reaction. Sorry, that's, you see, almost seem to stop in the middle of a sentence there. So can I, can, this is so interesting. So lately I have been, <laughs> every time I edit the podcast, I'm like, I tend to just go on and on and on and say the same thing five times. So I'm <laughs> going to start ending my sentences. <laughs> so, and the past two times that I've actually tried to do that, you've been like, you stared at me blankly, like, well, that was an abrupt ending. So now I'm now I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what I should do. <laughs> it was just really sudden. It was like this. Just, just In my mind, stop I'm talking. Like, stop it here. Stop it here. You've made your point. Stop it here. <laughs> I remember back in, oh, when would it have been? Maybe around 2015, 2016, where I was still working on my relationship with food. Not that that work ever ends, but. And I was at that point where I was thinking, okay, maybe I could date. Because for years I was like, I can't date. I'm too messed up. I'm broken. I can't date while I'm struggling with this food and body thing. And then, you know, Brooke Castillo, mm -hmm. she, on her podcast, it's actually, maybe I could find it. It's one of the earlier episodes years ago. She talked about rejection. I think it was a listener Q&A actually. And she talked about it as in, it was someone who wanted to go out and date, but they were so frightened of rejection. And she was setting them the task to go out and like the whole task is not to meet anyone. The task is to practice getting rejected. So yeah. it's this very active seeking of rejection. And that for me at the time was like, it was mind blowing to me back then because I'd never thought of it in this way. It really worked for me at the time. I was able to go out and be like, right, okay, like this is my only job. I've just got to go in and survive it and know I can survive it and almost build up this resilience now that's this is different because it's one area you know you talk about going on right. dates with people you don't really know so that's a different type of quote-unquote rejection compared to in other areas of your life or with people whether it's at work or closer to you so I think that that can be helpful for anybody who's holding themselves back from doing something being in New York and going to meetups and whilst I'm a fairly sociable person there is still nervousness about going into somewhere where I don't know anyone especially here where I've been really taken aback by how out of the culture I feel I think I just thought it's just going to feel like London or I just thought I knew American culture more and the the sort of awkwardness of that a little bit and I caught myself when I was going to this meetup on Sunday I caught myself thinking Sarah just stop taking yourself so seriously yeah like, it was a real moment where I realized I was playing out these scenarios in my head of which I was the really the most important person in this story. And I'm like, you're not the only character in this story. And that helped. And it wasn't a, um, it didn't feel self-critical. Yeah, I was just going to you know, say. It could come out like that. I get yes. how it could come out like that. It didn't feel like that at all. It was this sort of realization of the absurdity of how important I was making this one scenario be about how I was received or how I needed to be in this particular 
yeah. um, situation, which leads me on to thinking about, and, and this I think could be quite a pertinent point of um, consideration as we're talking about this subject, is what are the things that we do to try to avoid it? Well, that was just coming up in my mind um, because I was thinking as you were talking about, well, I guess especially when you talked about the meetup in the city, I don't know, that there's something about that type of rejection that feels especially vulnerable to me in groups of new people where the point is to connect. Um, and I was thinking how much I used to avoid, I would obviously, I mean, this is a shocker, but I would binge to, to avoid that because, well, first of all, it was just a, a way out. But it also, it was like confirmation bias. It was kind of like, I'm a mess, see? Like, this is why nobody could ever like you or love you because you're a mess. And this is just further proof that you're a mess. You're not in a position to be liked or loved. So it would just keep me in a place where I felt like it made sense for me to be rejected. Because as long as I was binging, it wasn't my real self. It wasn't my real life. And I think body image rejection as well. It was sort of like, well, I'm rejecting myself too. Um, I won't be rejected first. But isn't that exactly what the pursuit of the ideal body promises? Is that you won't be rejected. People will like you more. People want to be around you. People will admire you. You'll belong. You'll be connected. All these things that get promised with the idea of looking a certain way. And that, I think, is the part that many people will talk about, the disappointment of not of not receiving that. But also, I, I know for me in particular, like with the dating thing back then, it was a case of I need to go into my cave and fix myself. And then when I'm fixed, I can come out because then I can come out less vulnerable. I'm less likely to be rejected um, because I fixed myself first. And I realized that <laughs> that wasn't. It's not how it works. You know? It's just not how it works to go into a cave to quote unquote fix yourself because we're relational beings, right? We exist in the context of other people as well because we're just, well, no one's an island. There's that. this sense of like armor, though, that the body will provide us with. So I've spoken before about this idea that I felt like this empty shell inside because all I was ever thinking about was food in my body. And so my personality had just sort of disappeared somewhere. And that rejection, like even where my body has met some kind of standard or as close as I was going to get, I would then show up, but I still found myself absent. And so there would come a rejection. There would, it was almost kind of, it was weird. It was like there would be this invitation to connect followed by rejection because I just wasn't there. But I felt to some degree, and I've heard people echo this, where because there's a socially socially agreed upon value system around a body, it felt like, well, it doesn't hurt as much because I still have this. I still have this idea of being liked. And even though it didn't feel real in and of itself, the image is some kind of armor that makes that made me feel better than the times when I didn't have that and when my body wasn't like that. And I will hear clients say that, like, I'd rather be, I'd rather have this, this armor. I'd rather have this one thing because it's easier to be rejected when you have something on the outside than it is when you have nothing on, you know, when you've got rejection and sort of this socially unacceptable body. So it's something that you can then cling to. Well, at least I've got this. Yeah, like at least in theory, people like me, at least in theory. Uh, it's even this performance, like I'm I'm social currency. I have some kind of social currency, even if it's kind of like money in the way it actually doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but people all buy into it. So it does. It's the same kind of idea with this social currency of the body. And and I think that, um, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure how that folded back into rejection <laughs> anymore, except except that it seems like a it's like this one card in your pocket against rejection. I think that that it's this idea. It's not the actual approval or validation or admiration or connection with someone. It's just this idea that you have this thing that might get it. It's like we've all agreed that this is something that might get us that, even if it never does. You know what I mean? It's 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 so theoretical. It takes on a life of its own, this idea of a body and the power of having a certain body. If you want connection and support around any of the topics we talk about on the podcast, we would love for you to join our membership community. Members have access to monthly online support groups, a private Facebook group, live episode recordings, and member-only Q&As. 
If you would like to join us, please head to lifeafterdietspodcast.com forward slash community. Now let's get back to the episode. Do you think there's a truth in that you're less likely to be rejected if you look a certain way? Yes. Yes. But I don't think it speaks to the heart of connection. I think that it's surface level. Depending on who you are, I think you could skate on surface level for a lifetime. You know, I think that there is a certain amount of belonging and invitation to connect that you that will be it's privileged to you when you look a certain way. But beyond that, it's it's anyone's game. And I and I think that I, I think it's a privilege. I, I, I don't deny that there's a huge privilege that gets you in the door. And then it's kind of like, well, what happens after that? But yes, I do. And I I think unfortunately so. Mm-hmm. I'm also thinking of the things that sometimes people do to avoid being rejected can then be the very thing that they get rejected for. Like? Well, it's that, I can't remember who said it, but they talked about it as the things that we do to try and get people to love us are the things that people love us for in spite of those things. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if, let's say you're the fixer and you're just trying to fix everybody's problems. That's who you are and that's how you get your value. Chances are those closest to you care about you in spite of the fact that you're always trying to fix everything. Yeah. Yeah. Or perfection. This idea of having the perfect clothes or the perfect home or the perfect, you are always happy. <laughs> it's like inauthentic in some ways, right? Like it, it, it's like, uh, I love her because underneath that perfection, she's just as real as any of us, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And I've got a couple of friends in my circle who are much more closed off about how they feel. They're not very open about their emotions. And chances are they do that as a form of protection. They don't want to be rejected for their feelings. But actually, that's the thing I feel like I kind of miss. <laughs> I would want more yeah. of that. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that seems to be a common. I don't know anyone who speaks any differently about it. Maybe we're in the wrong, maybe, not the wrong, but maybe that's because we have a biased sample of people once again. But. I find that vulnerability is such an asset. I just love people who can be vulnerable. To me, that's so much more connecting. Mm -hmm. More so than power, right? And I think that that's the way that some of us go about trying to win the hearts of others or to belong is through this, this, this power angle of having more status. Well, power can be attractive, but that's not the same as connecting. So there's a difference. And I think those two can get conflated. Right. You know, wanting to exactly. be attractive to people doesn't necessarily mean that people feel connected to you, especially if they feel, if you feel in awe of someone, I don't know about you, but if ever I felt in awe of someone, I don't feel connected to them. That's right. not a word yeah. I It's actually the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I admire them and I think whatever it is about them, I'm looking at and think that's great. Yeah. What would, um, what would you reject in someone? What would be a reason that you would reject someone? And what would be a reason that you felt drawn to someone? Well, I said this to you after our last recording, we'd finished recording, but I said about how I'd been talking to that guy at the bar and he'd yelled at the server and he had seemed like such a mild mannered, pleasant guy. He was a professor of AI. I mean, just fascinating. I was really fascinated by him. And then he spoke like this and I was like, there is nothing you can do to redeem yourself now in my eyes. Yeah. And I was perfectly pleasant and I didn't mind carrying on talking to him, but that was it. It was going to be this one conversation and that would be it. So, so like rudeness? It's not even rudeness because you can be rude. It is, it's the talking down to someone. It's humiliating someone. That's more than rudeness in my mind. And that's how I read it. Someone else might see it. And again, I'm in New York. Maybe that is just being rude. I've never mm. seen anybody speak to staff like that at a bar. So yeah, again, it could be cultural, but in my mind, I was like, there's nothing you could say. There was a, it was like a switch in my brain about who this person now was because of how they spoke to this person. That's just a fresh one. So that came to mind. I think I can have reactive moments of rejecting. And then again, because I recognized it more having, (laughs) having talked about it in therapy and stuff, So sometimes let's say I perceive I've been wronged by somebody in some way. My initial response is I want to pull the shutters down and like shut them out and be like, I'm done. See ya. Really quick. Just pull those shutters down. And now I say to myself, you don't make this decision when you're feeling like this. So you don't make a decision about 
whether you're cutting somebody out or not while you're feeling like this. That's not the time to do it. And then quite often, as my emotional state changes, more information comes to light about the situation or I, I'm just in a different place, then I'm not likely to go there. It's like a reflex that happens mm-hmm. and it's just, just a self-protection thing. Mm-hmm. It's the typical avoidant. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to like shut this out so yeah. that I don't get hurt. Um, but having recognized it now, I can go like, okay, I just in this moment, I am feeling and then name what I'm feeling. I don't need to make a decision about this relationship or this person in that moment. In the bar, I could because I just, I'd only started talking to him 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it was no one who I knew. It, it also feels like a different scenario because in the first example, um, it didn't feel like a defense or a protection, that reaction. Whereas in the second example, it's a bit more about you. There's yes. a protective mechanism. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It wasn't aimed at me at all. No. And I think there could be certain views that people could espouse. Again, people that I don't necessarily know that well or have a relationship with, which is more likely to put them in a um, not my cup of tea category. Right. <laughs> or cup of coffee, I should probably no, say. No, it's yeah. tea. It's tea here. Just don't say this <laughs> the alley on the street. You have to you have to move that one around. Um, you don't have to. What would draw you, what would connect you to someone? What would? Vulnerability was the first thing that came uh, to mind. Open-mindedness, kindness, real, that real kind of um, tolerance and accepting of difference. And I don't just mean cultural difference, just difference of opinions. That I really like. I really like when I see that in somebody, I really like that. Yeah. And I'm drawn to that. And I think you're going to be my friend, whether you want to or not. <laughs> Even if you reject me. (laughs) Yeah. Can you remember the last time that you rejected somebody? Hmm. Hold on, I have to think. Do you ever reject clients? Or do you always work with anybody who wants to work with you? Like, do I reject them emotionally? Or do I I say we we shouldn't work together? Yeah. I I don't. I don't say, I don't. Unless it's not a good fit from a practical point of view. You know, from a, like, I think there's someone better suited to help you. I, I don't reject. Okay. The closest I've ever come to working with someone and feeling that is typically, in fact, it's very hard for me to come up with an authentic rejection of someone. My rejections are typically defensive. I had one client in particular. Um, she she wasn't she wasn't client. I never heard from her again. She had she came to me for a consult, and I I have never spoken to someone so um, closed. It was so interesting to me that she had even scheduled the session because she said, like, I've been listening to you for a while and following you for a while. I really resonate with what you say. But then she wouldn't, she really wouldn't speak. And she acknowledged as much. She said, like, I'm, I feel very rigid. I feel like I don't want to change. And I don't think ultimately that she was in a position, she wasn't ready for, for, for what I was proposing that we do. But I felt immediately in her, in her closedness, which I recognized intellectually as her own, you know, like her own, that was her protection. But I felt so, so outside of it. And I remember that I found it very difficult to not want to reject that, like to feel like, oh, you don't want me to come in, then I don't want to come in. You know what I mean? And that was a really hard, and that was just a consult call. (laughs) I remember it still, um, that it was really difficult. So, so most of the times when I will Reject it will come from perceiving that someone doesn't want me to come in or someone doesn't want me too close. And I and I don't like that. <laughs> so I feel rejected by that um, in in the body sense. Of course, and intellectually, I can make a different sense of it. Uh, but I will walk away. And, and, and I would say this much, much more exists in personal situations. I don't really have this come up with clients because it's a completely different environment. We're there for a different reason. I take on a different role. But when it's personal and when there's it's peer to peer. I very quickly, very quickly will assume the role of like, I will assess, do you want me here or not? And if you, if I perceive that you don't, or that you want someone more than me, or you like someone better, my instinct is to shut off. And again, this is something I have also worked on that, um, um, you know, it's, it's a lot more of the staying and of tolerating that distress and, you know, staying open-minded to the situation, but it's more about the fear of rejection itself that will make me reject somebody. Um, 
the other thing that that will create a rejection instinct in me is performing. So if I sense that someone is performing to impress or to um, elevate themselves, I I really have a problem with that. Um, and that's always been that's that's always been something that I I just even if I have compassion for it, and even if I can be like, it's probably defense. Ah, no, then I, then I can make my way in. But immediately there's a sense of like, no, no, no. In that moment when you're feeling the rejecting, not when you've kind of talked yourself around it, mm. what is the intention you're projecting onto them? What do you mean? So when you're talking about someone performing, I'm imagining, I don't know, someone dominating a conversation. That's where my mind yep, went. Yep. Uh -huh. So in that moment of initial wanting to reject, what is it you're believing about that person initially before you kind of work through it? Yeah. Uh, well, immediately, um, without censoring myself, the first thing that comes to my mind is that they're trying to assert power. You know, and as soon as I say this, I'm like, I know people like that in my life. <laughs> like, I'm like, I know why. I know I. Okay. Like someone who's trying to own, own this, own the stage, uh, which ultimately feels like then I will be, I someone have, will have control over me, and I will be a, I will be a, a what's it called? Like a what is it called? Um, like a pawn in their game, or I will be, I will be an inferior. Yes. So there is this power. Power is something for me. There is some kind of theme around power for me. So if I sense that, I want to, I, I want to get away from that. Um, also, it folds into my feeling misunderstood because I tend to be quiet and I observe and I take my time asserting my personality in a place. And so if I feel like someone has said like, oh, I, I, I can own the stage because you don't, that to me feels like, oh, no, no, you don't know me yet. I haven't had time to tell you what my opinion is. Um, and I feel misunderstood about like that I have been deemed some kind of quiet, meek mouse and uh, and they're sort of like dominating me. And I'm like, yeah, I hate that. <laughs> that's one of the worst. Uh, that's where rejection will come up a lot for me. And that's where rejection will hurt me the most. When I perceive that I've been rejected because I've been perceived as something that I don't feel is 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 accurate. Mm. So food. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was thinking, how to bring it around? I'm wondering if it's worth speaking to those that find rejection stops them from doing. Actually, I want, maybe I'll pose it in another way. I'm going to pose the question to you, Steph, and also to the listener. Okay. If you had zero fear of rejection. Is there anything you'd be doing differently? I don't think so. I think it might, I might show up differently um, socially, but I wouldn't be pursuing it. I don't feel I'm holding myself back, but then we can talk about in, not interpersonal rejection. Like I might write a book. <laughs> yeah. Like that kind. Um, yes. I think I would write a book like faster. <laughs> I wouldn't be humming and hawing about it. Uh, what about you? I don't feel like there's a specific, I feel like life would just be easier if there was <laughs> zero fear of rejection. Sure. It almost seems a bit narcissistic though. <laughs> you know, there's something about, yeah. I don't know, that fear of rejection is almost, it has its roots in empathy. I was just going to say, I think like even the thought of not having it feels um, like something's wrong with that to me. Like there's something like, oh, there must be a value in rejection though. Like I'm feeling like a, I don't want to imagine a world in which there is none. To me, it sounds like not caring about what anyone else thinks. Because if there was no fear of rejection, does that mean I just wouldn't care what anybody else thought? Something in there doesn't feel quite, doesn't sit quite right with me. Mm. Just because you and I are killing it and showing up in our lives doesn't mean that everyone else is feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. They might be sitting there going, well, good for you two. <laughs> well, you know what? It surprised me that I even answered that question the way I did. But circling back to rejection of self, I think that's why. I think that because I have, I don't reject myself as much, nearly. I don't really, re I work very hard to not reject myself. And because of that, the rest is easier. So while I was rejecting myself so wholeheartedly, I think that that uh, would, I wasn't showing up because I didn't want to be with myself. I didn't want to see, I didn't want to disappoint myself. I couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand the way it felt, but I'm not afraid of myself so much anymore. I'm not afraid of my own quote unquote rejection because I feel like I 
also have compassion now. So I won't stay in rejection for too long. So anything that is, I think the scariest things to do are ultimately, for me anyway, more about my self-rejection than anything else. Because if I can, I'm, I actually am quite comfortable with someone else rejecting me if, if, as long as I feel confident in myself. Like I, I it's kind of like, oh, that's fine. So as long as I've got my own back to me, there's nothing scarier than not having, like, than feeling like you can't stand yourself. Like that's the ultimate feeling I would want to run from. I do think for me, the last four or five weeks, I have been rejecting myself more. And that isn't not liking myself and it's not not having any compassion for myself. But I found it really, really challenging to be able to meditate the last few weeks. And even like since I got to New York, just it comes to bedtime when I normally would. And I'm like, <laughs> and sometimes I'll sit there and close my eyes for 10 minutes, but I'm just getting lost in my thoughts. I'm nowhere close to being able to come back and sort of stay with myself. and. I think there's just still that, yeah, the the disorientation of where I am. Yeah. Is that a rejection? It's it's a difficulty staying with myself. I keep leaving. I keep going. Like I can't or I'm not I can't. I am finding it difficult to come back and just stay and be, which is, is making me feel less um cohesive. Yeah, you know? mm. we've got different parts of us. And like when all those parts are kind of gathered in closer together. And I'm like, okay, I feel okay. You know, even though I've got a part that's, you know, playing up a bit over here and this part wants to go over here. It's like, as long as I keep them close enough, it's okay. Like, this is us, all these parts. And I guess there's a sort of, um, it's feeling a little bit fragmented. Like that, that doesn't feel like yeah. it's happening. And I don't know the rejection is quite, quite the right word. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I picture your parts all over the place, just trying to make sense of things. Like it's almost a defense, not, not, not like a rejection, but a, like, we are just really busy trying to figure things out for us. Like it, th there's a problem maybe going on. So I need to be vigilant over here. Um, rather than like a, I don't want to be cohesive. That's a nice reframe. I'll take that. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm getting free coaching here last <laughs> week and this week. <laughs> well, I'm not asking you questions. I'm just telling you what I think. <laughs> I know. Well, coaches do that as well, don't they? Yeah, we do. But American that way. Aren't we? <laughs> we therapists do as well, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> you pose to be British. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time that you rejected your body? So the first thing that comes to mind comes from how it physically feels so it's been stiffer more uncomfortable my foot had got so much better over the last few months and it got worse again basically since a couple of days before coming to New York my back's been bothering me and I had a real moment of um I want to say self-pity I'm not saying that in a self-critical way I think that was just kind of the reality of it and it was just this real resistance to my body not behaving the way I think it should behave how does resistance show up frustration despair at times as well I guess because I'd felt so good for a number of months and before that had been a couple of years so then there's fear in there as well that I mean, if I could know that it's just going to be for a week, I'm going to feel a bit stiff, my foot's going to play up a bit, and then things are going to improve. Okay, that's fine. I'll accept that as long as I know it's going to change, you know, yeah. which can come in with like body size. Now, okay, I'll accept my body as it is now, as long yeah. as I know it's going to change. Mm -hmm. So that idea of being able to just come to the moment and not resist, because when I resist it, I cause even more suffering. There's the physical discomfort of foot and aches and creaks and not feeling particularly comfortable my body doesn't feel particularly well at the moment when I add on all the the mental and emotional stuff on top of that my suffering increases tenfold so trying to just come back to that non-resistance accepting place and all that stuff <laughs> are you are you navigating that currently yes yeah. yes I am and I had a real moment actually of last night getting myself a bit worked up about it. And then I just had this complete surrender to it. And the, it was like, it was like a switch. I went from being so tense and 
stressed with with everything and then I just let go and then it was like where's where's my distress gone and I was I I was trying to find it I was (laughs) lying there in bed like laughing to myself it was extraordinary I'll tell you what switched it and I I don't know yeah I was gonna say you you said that so lightly like I just let go. Like, what I mean? No, it wasn't. It down. Wasn't, yeah, no, it wasn't really letting go this one. It, it it meant that I ended up letting go. So have you heard of Muji? No. So he is a, I don't know if you call him a, a guru guy. So he talks on like, <laughs> guru, or just a, a guru. guru. Guy. That's the official <laughs> term. Yes. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> he talks a lot about awareness and non-resistance, non-duality, that kind of thing. And one of the things I'd heard him say before, which came into my head, I heard this a long time ago, and I don't think it particularly resonated with me at the time. But he talked about when you are suffering, intensely suffering, to ask the question, who is it that's suffering? And to try and find the self or the part that is suffering. Mm. And I asked that question, and I couldn't find it. Oh. I couldn't find the part and I was searching and I'd, I'd literally gone from I was having a few tears to just everything dried up so normally like I love a cry I'm all for it doesn't mean doesn't normally mean anything big if I have a cry it but it's releasing yes and so normally I will cry and then there's like a peace that sort of comes after that it wasn't like that it was literally distressed to like somebody just turn the tap off and I was just because you couldn't <laughs> find the part yeah huh that would have distressed me more. No, it was this complete shift in how I experienced myself in that moment. Uh, Everything, it it just, no, it shifted because I couldn't find it because I realized it didn't exist. Oh, oh. And so the suffering felt like an illusion. It was a whole big, it was a whole thing. <laughs> what were you stressed about? What was the, what was the object of the distress at the, that you were asking yourself what, who you were suffering for about, about your body? Yeah. So, well, it was okay. about, it was about stiffness. There was physical yeah. pain. There was a sense of aloneness because actually being out here in New York, whilst I'm getting out and doing things, what I hadn't anticipated is how much time I still then have on my own. So if you think of all the hours there are in a day and I'm here in this place on my own and I have my work and then I go out for a couple of hours, there's still quite a number of hours in there of yeah. Like this empty time, this empty space that I don't have my usual things around me. I don't quite know what to do with myself. I mm. was feeling really adrift. It, it 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 kept going up a level and it got really big and existential about my life and my place in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> from a <my> foot. <laughs> it went from my foot right up to that. I, I just think it's interesting that going from that to turning it off. Like, like who is the, who is the I that's suffering? Is it because it's just so big? Like these things are so big that it, I I don't know. I have to think about that more. I think it was, it was realizing that what I was suffering about was a story. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And actually, like if I brought it back to the grounded reality, I'm okay. I can still walk around for an hour, an hour and a half a day. I've got security. I've chosen to be here. I've met some great people already and I have had fun. And that's what I mean by an illusion because it kept spinning out into this huge thing right. that was just this product of my mind. Yeah. So it wasn't real. Like the problem wasn't real. It can be yes. real, but it wasn't. Yes, yes, yes. I, that's that's that clearest things for me. But it was, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how we got from rejection. To that. Yeah. Well, I was saying, <laughs> when was the last time you rejected your body? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you were saying it was in the foot. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one of one of the things. Yeah, and then I keep getting like the odd phantom pain here and there. That's not not massive pain, but I'm thinking, oh my goodness, oh it's going to be this, it's going to be that, and I'm in the US, and I don't know, they probably won't honor my health insurance, my travel insurance, <laughs> like literally, and I, and then I wouldn't even know what to do. Like, when would I get something yeah. checked out? Because you get yeah. it checked out sooner if you were back home compared to if you were away. Would it be worth getting on a plane to go back to see my doctor? And this is just from like a mild pang on my stomach or something, <laughs> a bit of wind. And I'm just, I going. get that though. I think when I came to see you, I had some like brief little bit of that when I was like, oh no, I, when I had like a pain, when something feels real, you're like, oh, I might need to follow this up. And then, you know, you just ha- go down the rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. You realize your vulnerability. Yeah. Maybe vulnerability is what, I mean, this is the second time vulnerability has come up. Granted, I just brought it up, but is there a connection between rejection and vulnerability? Well, we, we probably can't 
be rejected unless there's a vulnerability to be hooked into. You know, like you were saying, actually, if you're feeling pretty good and grounded in yourself, things that might otherwise leave you feeling rejected don't. So I think the vulnerability to be vulnerable and open to connection means that we are also open to rejection. Yeah. So, yeah, I think vulnerability is the requirement to connect, but it's also the thing that allows us to yes. feel rejected. Yes. I would, I when I have rejection or resistance, which is another question I was going to ask is, are those the same things? Um, I look for vulnerability. So if I'm resisting something or rejecting something, there's typically a vulnerability underneath it. Mm -hmm. What I do with that? I don't know. Sometimes just naming it, um, recognizing that that's what's going on, that it's just about feeling vulnerable helps. Well, I, I don't think that the task is about getting rid of the vulnerability, but I think that the task is understanding what the vulnerability is and just checking out its validity. Because sometimes it's we're vulnerable about things because it's it's a story in our minds about ourselves that we're believing yes. and we feel really vulnerable because there's a story going on in our heads that we think is true. Yes. Compared to the natural or perhaps the, and if natural is quite the right word, the vulnerability of just being seen. People really seeing us and then rejecting. Yeah. That's got to be the worst, right? Has that ever happened to you? I don't know, because um, <laughs> Byron Katie quotes coming into my head again, sorry. She says that no two people have ever really met each other. Like, we can't, <laughs> like, everything's a projection. So we, mm. I've never been seen, and I've never really seen anyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking it to new lengths lately. <laughs> I know. Sorry for all the like spirituality talk, people. It's not always <laughs> helpful for everybody because not everyone thinks about it in these terms. But um, yeah, I don't know. Is, is the is the short answer? To yeah, that. I suppose that's a really ridiculous question for me to ask because I I don't even know. It's not ridiculous, Steph. Oh well, a little bit. When I'm thinking about answering it for myself, I'm like, I don't know. How would I know if I've been seen, and how would I know if that was the reason for the rejection? There have been times where I feel like I've shown up authentically. Again, social media has done this, where I'm like, I'm just here, me talking in my closet. Like, you know, it feels very safe to do so, and then people are like, Oh, I don't like what you said, or I'm unfollowing you, and it's like, Well, that's because you misunderstood me, so then you didn't really see me. Or maybe people are like, I just don't like the way you talk so fast, and your energy just doesn't sit right with me. And then I'm like, Well, then that's a real rejection. It feels like, but again, it goes back to. Was it Byron Katie who said like, was it? I don't know. Said what? Um, now I've, uh, about. Oh, you don't fit in the, with their world. Yes. How they yes. want the world to be. Yes. yes. Which is how I've made sense of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I think we're well at time. Oh. Mm. Well, look at that. I feel like there's things in this conversation that we did not get to. Mm. Um. So if you listener, which I really like how we're calling, we're just like, it's like, dear reader, dear listener. Uh, if we have not touched on topics that you would have liked to see addressed and you want to reject this episode and let us know how we might have covered something better or questions still outstanding, please do let us know. Yes. Okay. All right. And if you want to come see us in New York. Yeah. And there's still a couple of tickets. So come and reject us in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Meet us in person, get to know us and then decide that you no longer want to listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, okay then. Thank you. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Bye. Bye.